Okay, hello. Welcome um, to the World Molecular Imaging Society live webinar presented today by the Imaging in Cell and Immune Therapies Interest Group, also known as ICIT. Um, moderating today, we have Dr. Gilbert Fruitt from King's College London and myself, Israt Alam. I'm at Stanford University, and together we are co chairs of ICIT. So the mission of ICIT is really to improve the monitoring of molecular and cellular immunotherapies. And we aim to do this through the identification of new biomarkers of immune response, as well as advancing the implementation of imaging technologies globally. We try to achieve this through, the facilit through facilitating um, cooperation and dialogue between scientists in academia and industry, as well as overseeing knowledge transfer and educational activities. So today's webinar, Zirconium 89 Oxine for Cell Labeling and Translation into Clinical Trials, is both exciting and timely. We'll be hearing more about an imaging tool that's recently been clinically translated um, and one that has really powerful implications for cell and immune tracking in patients. We are thrilled to have with us Dr. Susan Lappie as our speaker today. She'll be sharing her um, expertise with zirconium-89 oxine, but also her valuable insights on its regulatory and translational pathway. Today's presentation is being recorded and will be posted on the WMIS website in a few days. And um, during this talk, please do submit your questions and comments in the Q&A or live chat bubble, and we'll have a Q&A session right at the end of Dr. Lappie's talk. So it's really my pleasure to introduce um, Dr. Susan Lappi, who's the Emmett O'Neill Second Professor um, at the O'Neill Comprehensive Cancer Center. She's a professor of radiology and chemistry and the cyclotron facility director at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. She's the vice chair of research in the Department of Radiology. Dr. Lappi's research interests include the development and translation of PET radionuclides and molecular imaging agents, and she oversees the production of a vast array of imaging radiopharmaceuticals, both for um, preclinical and clinical needs. She has over 140 publication, uh, publications, and her group holds over 15 approved INDs and supplies zirconium, um, copper, manganese, and other isotopes across the USA and internationally. Dr. Lappi is a fellow of SNMMI and a strong advocate of radiopharmaceuticals and the training of future and nuclear radiochemists, um, nuclear and radiochemists um, at all levels. So um, Dr. Lappi, thank you so much for your time today. And uh, without further ado, I shall hand over to you. Fantastic, it's wonderful to be here and thank you so much for the invitation uh, to share a little bit of our work. And so um, while I'm here on behalf of our group, I do want to uh, mention that this, this was really a team effort. There was a lot of people involved in this, both from the chemistry, but also the regulatory and clinical side, uh, as well as quality control as, and the, uh, the healthy volunteers that have donated literally their uh, blood, sweat, and tears for this one. So a couple disclosures. I receive uh, research support from several companies and I sit on advisory boards, um, and, but they are not affiliated with this work. And I also wanted to mention that a portion of this work was conducted in collaboration with Cardinal Health, uh, who's in commercial industry pharmacy. So a little bit about our program. So as mentioned, I'm at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. We are in Birmingham, Alabama. The, uh, the cyclotron facility and the advanced imaging facility are in the center of the fairly large medical complex at the O'Neill Comprehensive Cancer Center, and the medical campus and main campus are contiguous. So this means you can walk from chemistry department to the cyclotron facility, and so we have a lot of interactions with our basic science colleagues and, and also have a lot of students working in our facility. The cyclotron was installed in 2013, so 10 years ago now. Uh, facilities were complete in July. Our first investigational new drugs um, were approved in 2015, and our first patient dose was in 2016. We are currently supporting more than 30 clinical trials with radiopharmaceuticals produced by our cyclotron facility. But sort of in the landscape of cyclotron facilities, we are a relatively uh, newcomer to the block. This is just the, uh, the layout of our facility and advanced imaging facilities. So at the bottom here, you have the TR24 cyclotron. Next to that, we have our preclinical radiochemistry area. And then adjacent to that, we have our CGMP suite, as well as our human use quality control and our radiopharmacy. 
One of the nice things about our cyclotron facility and radiopharmaceutical manufacturing area is we are immediately adjacent to the, uh, the PET uh, imaging area. So we have the two human use PET CTs as well as the PET MRI. We have uh, the preclinical area is on the sixth floor of the same building. And then adjacent to this area, we also have a, a metabolite analysis space. So we can do things like take blood samples while the patient is on the PET CT or PET MRI and do full metabolite analysis. And so the proximity of this and the radiochemistry areas just makes it really nice uh, for translation of novel compounds. This is our TR24 cyclotron. It's an advanced cyclotron systems machine, 15 to 24 MeV protons. It's variable energy machine, which means we can make a wide variety of different radioisotopes. It has two extraction ports, and we currently have four beam lines, but we actually just received funding to expand one of these beam lines into three additional ones. So we will be expanding our capacity in the very near future. And we can irradiate solid, liquid, and gas targets. So this is really part of a broader, um, what we call the bi-directional translational molecular imaging program at UAB. So our cyclotron facility focuses on these new isotopes to produce them and the, also the molecular imaging agent development. We can move this forward into in vitro testing. We have the capability to do a comprehensive small animal imaging. PET CT and PET MRI in the advanced imaging facility allows us to translate these into early phase clinical trials. And then we can support broader clinical trials with both molecular imaging and therapeutics. We can then take that information, go back, and then redesign our novel molecular imaging agents and, and work on new isotopes. Most of this takes place in radiology, but we are in a fairly large community. Um, so we do have a lot of collaborations, both at the hospital and in basic science. So we have a lot of collaborations in oncology, but also neuroscience, pulmonology, cardiovascular disease, as well as uh, with collaborators in chemistry and biomedical engineering. This is our list of active radio tracers for human use. So as this list looks similar to other lists that you might see at other um, facilities, but I do want to point out that we do have a number of clinical trials that are ongoing with zirconium-89 compounds that we make internally. So we have a clinical trial with zirconium-89 trastuzumab, zirconium-89 patitumab, and then zirconium-89 white blood cells, which I'll focus on in a minute. And then we also have several agents that are shown here with the asterisks that are first in human or very early phase compounds. So we are um, participating in a clinical trial with Granzyme B. This is a peptide that targets uh, a marker of activated uh, T cells. And then we also have the white blood cell agent. And then very recently, we received our approval for a first in human study with another amino acid called methyl FAMP. In addition to um, these uh, sort of list of human use radiopharmaceuticals, we have a very active program where we work on development and translation of novel radioisotopes. And by novel, I kind of mean beyond fluorine 18, carbon 11, nitrogen, and gallium that you may be familiar with. So we are working on scandium 43 and 47 as a sort of a matched pair for theranostics. We've done a lot of work with titanium 45 and then manganese 52. These three here at the bottom, copper 64, zirconium 89, and lead 203, we make internally, but we also ship them out to other sites, and we make them in um, conditions that are suitable for both preclinical and translation for human use, both at our facilities and at partnering facilities. So I want to uh, sort of home in on this non-invasive imaging of cell populations, which is of interest to this group. Um, so of course, we're talking about really how do we track the fate of both endogenous or different engineer cell populations? Historically, this has been widely used for infection imaging. So thinking about radio labeled white blood cells, which is where we're starting. But of course, the current interest is expanding. So thinking about, can we understand the fate of stem cells or CAR T cells or other cell populations of interest? We and others have looked at tagging cells using a number of techniques. So this can be using reporter genes, modification of the cell surface, or other non-perturbing labeling techniques. And so this is a, a nice publication from, uh, from another group that had this great figure that showed kind of different aspects of labeling and imaging of cell populations. 
So we can engineer different radiopharmaceuticals that can take advantage of specific receptor uptake. We can engineer compounds that uh, take advantage of endocytosis properties of different cell populations. And we can look at transporter uptake uh, specifically through the cell membrane. We have been looking at passive diffusion where basically we're radio labeling a very lipophilic compound. That compound makes it across the cell membrane and can be, um, and basically is taken up in the center of the cell. And other groups have looked at absorption onto the cell membrane or direct binding and conjugation to different cell membrane protein, proteins. As I mentioned, our technique uses the passive diffusion technique. And really the thought was that labeling of intact cells using this lipophilic carrier may lead to less per perturbation of biological pathways, which may impact homing and pharmacokinetic profiles. So we're basically trying to modify the cell um, in a small manner as possible. So we don't really want to attach things to the outside of the cell or, um, or upregulate different transporters and that sort of thing. And so this historically has been used a lot. And so this is just an example from a clinical study uh, where we were using uh, technetium 99M for cell labeling, looking at a GI bleed. And so basically these are the, again, the patient's own cells, they're radio labeled or tagged and then re-injected. And we can get very nice images showing the distribution of those cells and showing anomalies such as you see here on the left-hand side. Um, in this image. And we can get a dynamic image that I hope is playing for all you out there. And then also we can take stills and look at um, direct, look directly at areas uh, that may need addressing. More commonly is also been, uh, that has also been used is the indium 111 labeled oxine. And so again, this is indium 111. It's a plus three uh, radio metal that can be used for spectra planar imaging. And we are surrounding it with these very lipophilic groups. And so essentially uh, non-specifically labeling these uh, different cell populations. And this again is just an example. This is a man that has had a recent onset of shoulder pain. He's advanced diabetes and a prior history of arthritis in the right shoulder. Shoulder. He had a bone scan uh, that demonstrated uh, sort of a nonspecific uptake in the left shoulder. Um, but you can see here very clearly the uptake of the white blood cells indicating the emergence of this arthritis. And so indium 111 and oxine has been used for radio labeling different cell populations for a very long time and it's been shown to be very safe and also a relatively effective imaging agent. I show here again another or sorry Indian 111 labeled oxine image just showing an infected an infected stent and so you can see basically uptake of the white blood cells that are accumulating at that site of infection. So the idea is, is that we can translate a lot of the work that's been done with indium 111 labeled oxine with zirconium-89. So zirconium-89 has a half-life of a little over three days, so it's very well matched for looking at the pharmacokinetics of these different cell populations. And also it's, of course, is a positron emitter. So we're essentially adapting this SPECT or planar imaging technique for PET. And the adaption may improve the sensitivity and or the resolution. And there's been a lot of very nice preclinical work by multiple groups showing the feasibility of this approach. And so again, similarly to the Indium 111 labeled oxine, we have our zirconium 89, we're surrounding it with these very lipophilic groups and using it to label different cell populations. At uh, UAB, we have a lot of ongoing work related to zirconium-89. We make zirconium-89 on a weekly basis, so we have it re readily available for multiple studies. We use it internally. We ship it to external sites, both nationally and internationally, typically to Canada. Uh, we have a lot of work going on with zirconium-89 preclinical radiochemistry. This includes chemistry with monoclonal antibodies, nanoparticles, and then cell labeling. We do a lot of small animal imaging studies and then prepare GMP uh, zirconium-89 radiopharmaceuticals. And we currently have three early phase uh, clinical trials with zirconium-89. And just showing some of our uh, other work with zirconium-89 labeled nanoparticles. This is an antibody imaging study, uh, an, an imaging agent for um, pulmonary fibrosis, uh, some of our clinical data, and then again, one of our other uh, non-targeted nanoparticle studies. 
As I mentioned, a lot of work has been done by other groups. This is just a, a very nice paper from the literature showing the zirconium-89 oxine technique. They did some very detailed studies showing that the zirconium-89 was retained in cells in vitro after 24 hours, and that in fact it was better than the indium-111 labeled tag. Uh, they also did some studies showing a similar pattern of distribution in animal models with both zirconium-89 labeled cells and indium-111 labeled cells. And I just show here some animal data from 30 minutes, two hours, one day, two days, and up to seven days after injection. The top row is the indium-111. The bottom row is the zirconium-89. And with the exception of the zirconium-89 that you see a little bit of bone uptake at the uh, later time points, you see a very similar biodistribution pattern with the zirconium-89 labeled cells and the indium-111. The same group also did a further nice study showing that the zirconium-89 label remains with the cell population of interest. And so if they use zirconium-89 to tag GFP cells in the ex vivo studies, they also showed that the zirconium-89 label stayed with those cells, which I thought was a very nice study. Uh, another group more recently showed uh, that this could also be uh, translated into non-human primate studies. And again, just showing very nice images with zirconium-89 oxine in cells uh, immediately after injection, one hour, four hours, and then up to seven days after injection. And again, showing the distribution that you would expect of intact cells in an animal uh, or, or in any, any organism where you see uptake in the liver, and then in the spleen. And so really some very nice proof of concept studies preclinically showing the feasibility of this approach. And so our goal was to really take this data and basically use it to translate zirconium-89 oxinate for human use. And so our goal was to develop a reproducible labeling procedure that was compliant with the appropriate regulations to validate that labeling procedure in-house, determine the stability of the drug product, and to verify that the cell labeling would be successful, both at end of synthesis and at expiry. We also wanted to look at cell efflux and cell viability. So we wanted to verify that the tag would stay with the cells and that the cells, cells stay alive to illustrate the stability. And then um, because we are working with blood products in our facility was not able to, um, to label blood products in house, we actually had to work with a local industry partner, Cardinal Health, to look at, to do some of this cell labeling. And so the idea was, is that we would make zirconium-89 oxine as a, uh, as a drug product. We would, we would take that zirconium-89 oxine and the patient's blood sample. We would ship it to Cardinal Health. We would work on procedures to basically uh, isolate the white blood cells and then radio label with zirconium-89 oxine using the uh, methods that they were already using for the Indium-111 then that radio label blood cells comes back to UAB and we re-inject the patient. And so I know that's a lot, but I'll, I'll walk through kind of how we got to this. So we had done uh, quite a bit of uh, zirconium-89 oxine studies and basically labeling for preclinical use. But when we did scale up, we did need to make some modifications. So some prior work used chloroform, uh, which is a class three solvent. So this has a limit of 60 ppm. And so we changed that to dichloromethane uh, for more, more robust quantification and just ease of use. We don't really like to use chloroform in our processes. We also, and, and those of you that have worked with zirconium-89 oxine uh, will realize this, it's very, very sticky. It's very lipophilic. It wants to stick to everything. And so after looking at a number of materials, glass was very uh, much better than plastic. We had to think about which filters we were going to use for sterile filtration uh, because the original filters that we use, we lost a lot of the zirconium-89 oxine on the filter. And we also found that the addition of polysorbate 80 helped with the, some of those losses and some of the stickiness. I mentioned we had to form this partnership with industry, which was actually very beneficial and worked really well uh, due to some of these regulatory challenges. At least in the US, there are different regulations that are associated with working for, with blood products. And, and because of this sort of complicated procedure, of course, the contracting and legal was, uh, was pretty interesting. 
And so here I'm just showing the preparation of the zirconium-89 oxine. So we make zirconium-89 as zirconium-89 ox oxalate, uh, as many places do. Uh, we dilute it, and then we combine with the zirconium with the oxine, creating the zirconium-89 oxine. We neutralize the zirconium-89, um, and then we have the oxine that's in the, the DCM layer, as I mentioned before. We vortex it and then we separate the layers. And basically the zirconium-89 oxine ends up coming out in the DCM. We take that layer, we dry it down. This takes several hours, we're carefully drying it. And then we make our final product. So we have our residue and then we basically dissolve it um, in this formulation here. We sterile filter it and then we add it um, to saline. And then that's basically the material that we are using for the cell labeling. I thought it'd be interesting to talk a little bit about our regulatory hurdles because this was a, kind of an interesting one for us. We do typically have a pre-IND meeting with the FDA when we're talking about a new agent and moving it forward. And so this was no exception. So we were um, fortunate enough to have a wonderful radio pharmacist, Denise Jeffers, who was really uh, took the lead on a lot of the regulatory aspects of this. And so before our meeting with the FDA, we had um, basically two very pointed questions. So the first one had to do with safety data. And so we wanted to know if existing safety data available for zirconium in other forms and the Indian 111 labeled oxine uh, labeled white blood cells would be sufficient to support the farm tox data needed for the IND. And our justification was that both zirconium in other forms and Indian 111 labeled white blood cells had been used safely in humans. Uh, Indian 111 labeled blood cells, they're used routinely, as I mentioned. And the idea was to keep the labeling procedures for the preparation of the zirconium 89 blood cells nearly identical or as close to possible as those that were already used for labeling clinically with Indian 111. And then we also noted that Indian 111 or zirconium-89 uh, oxine had been used in preclinical models, but not yet in humans. So the FDA came back and they said that the existing human safety data for these two compounds might be sufficient to support farm talks. And we had a little bit more of a discussion after this response as well. Um, they wanted us to think about the mass dose and to comment a little bit about the differences between the zirconium-89 compound and the Indium-111 labeled compound, and then also looking at um, sufficient ed evidence from the literature, looking at our patient population. They also, not surprisingly, asked us for um, some radiation dosimetry estimates um, based on the maximum dose, and they also recommended fairly strongly recommended that our IND protocol included whole body dosimetry on the early enrollees. And so that's that was really the first cohort and, and that's what we're, we're just finishing up now. Our second question was about the CMC section. Because we were making zirconium-89 oxine as the drug product and then working with this commercial partner, we were wanted to understand where we needed to do the validation testing. So we asked if the validation testing uh, would be of the zirconium oxine would be sufficient. Uh, we let them know that the oxine would be sterile filtered into a final product vial and that the quality control test would use sort of the standard array of tests that we typically do. Um, they came back and they said, no, they wanted more. So the CMC section wanted, they wanted information on the intermediate, on the oxine intermediate, inter information on the radio labeling chemical intermediate, chemical characterization for the zirconium oxine complex, and then uh, the CMC information basically of the oxine product that was what we already proposed. They also wanted us to include the white blood cell radio labeling procedure and quality control sheet, and then do quality control uh, on some uh, samples of the zirconium-89 white blood cells. This was actually um, a little tricky because we had to get patients uh, or, or volunteers to basically donate blood. Uh, this was a separate IRB protocol, basically just to do the validation runs. And so that was kind of interesting. Healthy people, uh, healthy people have lower white blood cell counts than, um, than the patient populations that we were looking at. And so we actually ended up having to take 120 milliliters of blood in order to get enough white blood cells to radio label. So I just include that as a general information for those of you wanting to do this. 
Uh, we did some radio labeled cell viability that they asked for as well. And um, they also wanted us to look at the retention of zirconium-89 in the cells and then characterization. And so those were really sort of the two big um, items that came out of our pre-IND for the FDA. And so back to the first one, they really um, sort of waved or said that we probably wouldn't have to do toxicity studies because we were basing a lot of our safety data on the Indium-111 labeled oxine. However, they did want us to include a mass limit of the oxine precursor. Uh, we looked at the manufacturing and also the USP we could not find a mass limit for oxine in the USP monograph, and we also couldn't find a no observed effect limit for reference. And so we had a lot of discussion about what is an appropriate limit. So we went back to our CMC section and we sort of thought about the chemistry. So in the three test runs, the highest amount of oxine was found to be about a little over a milligram or 1.4 milligrams. And importantly, as you remember, we're not actually injecting that drug product into humans. We're using that to label the white blood cells and there's an efficiency there, which is definitely not 100%. So a lot of the oxine is actually eliminated in the cell labeling procedure. Uh, we didn't have a, a no observed effect limit set for oxine. However, we did find some data that said uh, basically the LD50 would be over uh, three, mil three um, grams in a person. So we basically said, even if 100% of the oxine was translated to the drug product, even if all the oxine made it through the whole uh, process, and if the full volume was used to label the leukocytes, um, the amount would be way, way, way less than any sort of toxicity study. And the FDA was ultimately okay with this rationale. As far as the other components, so basically looking at cell viability. So we did some cell viability study, as well as looked at the efflux of zirconium-89 oxine and other cell types. Um, this, a lot of this work was done by Adriana Masicano, who was a postdoctoral fellow with our group and was published a few years ago in J-label compounds. This is just shows the acceptance criteria and the results. And so we basically, uh, took zirconium-89 oxinate and validated it as a drug product where uh, in a similar fashion to how we validate other compounds in our facility. So uh, filter membrane, pH, appearance, strength, uh, radionuclidic purity, radiochemical purity, uh, residual solvents, the only one we had was the dichloromethane, um, endotoxin, and sterility, of course. And then we also went through several validation batches with the, uh, the Cardinal site and using um, samples from healthy volunteers to basically understand the labeling and create a robust methodology. And so this is kind of the procedure. So we have, uh, we actually have two syringes um, where we're pulling blood. So these are two 60 mil syringes. We uh, do the separation um, of whole blood and get the white blood cell pellet. As I mentioned here, this is done at the commercial pharmacy. They um, basically take that and then radio label it with our zirconium-89 oxine as the sterile human use product, put it together, and then bring that back to UAB. This, of course, all has to be done within a very rapid time frame, And so we kind of have everybody at the ready uh, when we do these studies. They're quite complicated. Fortunately, we did get our study may proceed letter. So this is uh, Dr. John McConathy, who's the physician in charge of the, uh, the trial. And so we were able to start this um, some time ago. And as I mentioned, we started with the dosimetry study that was requested by the FDA. So after some internal discussion, we agreed that we would start with six subjects. So as I mentioned, we the blood is drawn and is ready to allow for sedimentation. We create the zirconium-89 oxine as this, um, as this human use um, drug product, and then it's labeled at this commercial pharmacy. Uh, it's taken back to UAB, and then it's injected into again into the same subject. We are imaging twice on the day of reinjection, and then again at 24 hours, 48 hours, and 72 hours post injection. We are also doing a head PET-MR at 24 hours post injection because our ultimate application for this, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute, is really looking at white blood cell trafficking in the brain because that's what we're interested in. 
During each PET CT imaging time point, we are also taking five to 10 mils of blood that's withdrawn just for accounting purposes. And so these are what the images look like. And so they look a lot like indium 111 or technetium distribution, but um, as you can imagine, because we are, uh, we're doing these in healthy volunteers, um, at the immediately after injection, you kind of see a circulatory system, heart, liver, spleen, et cetera. And then we see that clearing out four hours, 24 hours, 48 hours, and 72 hours um, with a normal distribution that you would expect to see uh, of white blood cells in a healthy volunteer. So again, uh, you know, a bit of background, and then we see the liver and the spleen. We, of course, are doing this on PET-CT and PET-MR. So just to show some of those images, this is the five-minute time point and then the 24-hour time point. And then I mentioned that we're also doing the, um, the PET-MR. Uh, we able to get very nice images um, in, with clear delineation of different organs. And then we're working on uh, some of the more quantification and early phase dosimetry. So as I mentioned, uh, the FDA did ask us for preliminary dosimetry before we submitted our package. And so our aim was really to look at the dosimetry and estimate that based on the Indium 111 labeled white blood cell distribution. So we assumed that basically in that white blood cell distribution, we had 30% to spleen, 30% to liver, 34% to the red marrow, and then the rest to the remainder of the body. We only use physical decay, basically sort of worst case scenario. And so this is some of the dosimetry that we did um, based on the Indium 111 labeled compound. And so we found that basically we're looking at um, 0.85 millisieverts per megabecquerel for men and 1.1 uh, for adult females. We've done now the calculations for the first three subjects white blood cell distribution. So we have these ROIs that were drawn during MIM, and then we now enter the data into Alinda. And we found actually that the effective dose was um, quite a bit lower. So our first three patients or subjects were all women. And so we got an effective dose of 0.62 millisieverts per megabecquerel, which is quite a bit lower uh, than originally estimated. So that was made everybody pretty happy. We also found a little bit of difference than what we expected from the Indian labeled compound in uh, liver, red marrow, and spleen. But otherwise, the distribution was remarkably similar to that reported for Indium 111 labeled white blood cells. So the original dosimetry, as I mentioned, it showed this effective dose that was slightly higher than actual values obtained from the zirconium-89 study. And we also showed a moderately lower uh, liver and red marrow dose and a slightly higher spleen dose than predicted using Indium-111 labeled data. We're also developing uh, automated advanced imaging workflows using uh, MIM software. And so this is in collaboration with Carlos Cardina at the UAB Radiation Oncology, who has been really working hard to develop automated segmentation of different organs. And so really we're trying to combine some of his techniques that he was using for external beam dosimetry and combining them uh, with our PET data, uh, basically to do rapid workflow analysis and basically uh, push this forward for both the white blood cells, but also for different compounds that we're onboarding at UAB. This just shows kind of some of the output. So we're able to calculate area under the curve. This just shows the brain. And so trying to develop these automated workflows so that we can get this rapid dosimetry analysis. So we are finalizing the dosimetry with those first six patients. Um, but of course, we're really excited to move this forward into different um, patient populations. And so the study that uh, we are working on is actually a collaboration with Dr. Jared Younger, who's in uh, psychology. And he's very interested to look at the distribution of white blood cells in healthy volunteers, but also in patients um, meeting the definition criteria for fibromyalgia, for chronic fatigue syndrome, and multiple sclerosis. And so his thought is that if we can tell something about the tracking of white blood cells into the brain, we can understand uh, something about neuroinflammation in the brain and uh, the severity of these disease states. And so as soon as we submit the uh, dosimetry study to the FDA, we'll be opening the study for these three patient populations and do 
doing um, the PET MRI and PET CT of uh, the zirconium 89 white blood cells in, in these patient populations. So we're very excited to start that. Uh, in, in additionally, we are also looking at ways to streamline this method. The production method that we've come up with that we've adapted from prior techniques is actually very difficult and it takes a long period of time. And so there was this very nice paper that was published a few years ago um, by another group in NucMed Bio um, who reported this nice kit-based method. And so basically, can we try to adapt these more automated or kit-based approaches um, into our zirconium-89 oxine study. And so we are working to basically adapt this into, um, into other, um, other, other areas. And so this just shows data from the paper where they were looking at labeling efficiency, both of the zirconium oxine, again, compared to indium-111, retention of the compound and cell viability. And so we are really excited to see this paper because it actually showed that it might really streamline our processes and, and enable us to have higher throughput with, uh, with patients for this study. And so we have some very preliminary data. We've adapted this KIP formulation that was um, published a few years ago and basically looking at the cell labeling efficiency and cell viability, which both look very, very promising. So I'm hoping that we can move this forward and, um, and use this for, uh, for some of our larger scale studies in the future. So that's kind of sort of the state of where we are with zirconium oxine and our white blood cell studies at UAB. So our zirconium 9 oxine can be used for cell labeling for both preclinical and human studies. The imaging, again, early, early days, and these are healthy volunteers, but it shows a very similar biodistribution profile to Indian 111 labeled oxine labeled white blood cells, which is what we would expect. The future studies at our institution uh, will investigate imaging of white blood cell movement into the brain. And we're excited about this because we really feel like this first in human study sets the stage for zirconium-89 oxine labeling and imaging of a variety of cell populations. And we're happy to discuss you know, our things that we learned during this process. Uh, this is our team. A lot of them, again, as I mentioned, contributed blood, sweat, and tears to this project. Uh, we have wonderful collaborators with the younger group who's really interested in the biology behind white blood cell trafficking in the brain. Uh, John McConathy, who's been our clinical collaborator, and Carlos Cardina, who's really been helping us a lot on the um, on the uh, segmentation and dosimetry analysis. And uh, just also would like to acknowledge our uh, financial support from the Department of Energy and NIH. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much for the invitation today and, and your uh, time and listening to us, to me. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Lapi. This was absolutely fantastic. And uh, I thought very, very insightful because it, you basically told us all about these tricks and uh, opened the eyes of many of the users and many of the listeners, I think, of all the complexities that obviously uh, you had to encounter and obviously successfully uh, managed uh, to overcome in bringing this uh, into humans, which obviously is a different endeavor than just doing it in preclinical research. So I have been looking at whether uh, and what the questions are that have been coming in. So one of the questions related to something that maybe uh, you have uh, mentioned at the beginning when you said already that you supply radioisotopes from your center to others. So I guess the question is around uh, the supply of zirconium-89. Would you supply this only as the radioisotope or would you actually supply this and ship this as the ready to use oxine for, um, uh, to others? It, maybe across the US or Canada? That's a good question. And I think we could absolutely look into that if that was of interest. Uh, I think we'd have to look at the stability and think about um, temperature sensitivity, you know, if we're shipping it across the US, but we're absolutely um, always interested in new collaborative efforts. And, you know, if, if we can work on that and enable studies at another site, we'd be happy to discuss that. And, and, and following up on this, could you imagine that uh, this would actually be possibly a business case in the future, that somebody actually produces the oxygen and ships it for across the continent uh, for use? Or would you 
see this more as a as a procedure that is actually be carried out and translated or transported into different centers for the production of dioxin on site. It depends. If this kit-based formula formulation works, it would be easy for sites to make their own oxine. It just depends on the capabilities of the site. If zirconium-89 is incredibly stable and we could ship it, what I would suggest is we ship it as like a dry material, like we dry it in the vial and then the site reconstitutes it. We would just have to do some studies trying to figure out you know, how um, how stable it was. And also, you know, we're labeling white blood cells, but I think other sites are going to want to label different cells and the formulation of those cells and how those cells are prepared, how concentrated those cell populations are. It's going to be probably a different uh, scenario each time. Okay. And as we are talking about uh, radioisotopes and also the ones uh, that you mentioned uh, earlier, where, uh, say, for example, manganese. I mean, we can see in the space uh, of the preclinical research that uh, uh, some people are trying to track cells for longer in vivo by using longer half-life uh, radioisotopes. I mean, it obviously depends on, on, on the formulation of those isotopes and so forth. But do you, in principle, see uh, any additional hurdles for this? And, and if so, what would they be from a regulatory perspective, saying going from zirconium to manganese? So the dosimetry is going to be tough. The dosimetry of zirconium is just really tricky. And I'm, I'm trying to, we're, all, we're injecting, you know, less than half millicurie into people. Um, with uh, things like long axis PET scanners, very high sensitivity PET scanners that we can inject very small amounts. I think that studies like this are going to become more amenable. Um, and maybe even things like manganese would be possible in people, but I think it's going to take high sensitivity PET scanners. The other thing to think about is the patient population. So we're doing this in non-oncology patients. In the oncology setting, uh, higher dosimetry or higher dose levels may be more, um, you know, um, acceptable. And so I think, again, it's a a case by case situation. I would love to see things like manganese labeled white blood cells in people with like a long axis PET scanner and super high sensitivity. I think that's I think that's the future. I think that's where we're going, and and I'm I'm really excited about it. So if you were able to list uh, that your top three candidates for uh, direct cell labeling approaches like that, what would be these three isotopes that you would put your money on? So the zirconium-89 uh, labeled study, it works. And people have shown that it, the label stays with the cell and it's very, it's it's nice and, and amenable. Um, I think manganese is, manganese is an excellent isotope. The, it has some additional gamma rays and it's very long lived. And so the dosimetry is, is going to be trickier. And so for the manganese applications, I think we are going to need sort of the next generation of PET scanners to, to make sure that we can keep the dosimetry reasonable. And then uh, I would say the third isotope is probably something we haven't thought of yet. So I'll, I'll leave that one out there for the audience. Okay, that's, that's brilliant. Um, as you brought into the conversation uh, cancer patients, I mean, one of the things that we hear often around from very many people, and we have uh, also seen several papers in the field, uh, where people actually try to label cell-based immunotherapeutics. And one of the questions that I could imagine that arises here is, and that is different to the white blood cell scans, is the fact that actually it's a therapeutic rather than a diagnostic that is being used. So what do you see are the potential regulatory hurdles that are then additionally coming uh, our ways when we try to do this? That's a great question and one I've thought about a lot. And so I actually think that if you have um, you know, approval to do the therapy, then to label the therapy with something like indium or zirconium oxine, I think the hurdle might not be too crazy. I think that the labeling with using this lipophilic method, where basically we're not mucking around with the cell too much and we're not like attaching things, we're not putting transport like reporter genes or something. I think actually that is probably, I would think that would be more palatable to the FDA. 
Um, and so the idea is, is you're, you're claiming that you're not changing the cell. So if you already have the therapeutic approved, I would think that hopefully it would be, uh, especially if we already have data and people, that it would be a relatively small hurdle to move it forward. I think, I think this, in my mind, this seems easier um, than uh, doing things like trying to uh, you know, stably label proteins on the outside of the cell or do something where you actually might change the cell significantly. But that's just, that's again, that's just my opinion. Yeah. So you wouldn't reckon that uh, the regulators come back to you and ask uh, for in-depth analysis of what the radioisotope actually does in terms of damage and what the consequences are on the expression of proteins of those cells in I mean, could imagine whether they still do their job or not as a therapeutic. So, so you think you think that is possibly not something we would need to worry about too much. So, I think if you had data, ex vivo data, that that might be acceptable, kind of like we did. So, we basically looked, make sure that the label is not coming out, make sure the cells are viable, and there's probably other things that you can do to basically say if we label these cells and they're sitting on the bench for a few hours or in an in incubator, something like that that they're still um, acting the way that they should. Um, I don't know what you could do in a person to verify the cells were still acting the way they should. But I think there are definitely some kind of bench tests that you could do to help assuage those concerns. Okay. And uh, you mentioned next generation uh, uh, PET scanners. That obviously was a comment relating to the sensitivity and probably uh, the making dosimetry easier by reducing the amount of radioisotope that you actually administer to the patient. So when you alluded to these next generation PET scanners, are you banking on sensitivity enhancements per se, or are you actually alluding to total body PET? Uh, every step is a little bit better. So total body PET, if we have all have total body PET scanners, that's great. Someone should buy us all total body PET scanners. Uh, if we have half body PET scanners, that's going to get us part of the way there. So I think anything to do with enhanced sensitivity and longer bore PET with that matter is, is going to be helpful. Um, you know, the, the idea of, of the best sensitivity is what we all want, but, you know, whether that's going to be feasible um, for everybody, including us, you know, I, I don't know. So yes, more sensitivity is better. I don't know that you necessarily need total body PET because we're, I mean, we're just doing this on our regular PET scanner because we don't have one yet. <laughs> but I guess it's on your Christmas wish list, uh, at least a half body PET or so. Yes, if, if anybody out there would like to buy us a present. <laughs> Then it goes this way. So whoever is out there and has too much money, maybe that's a way of, <laughs> of making uh, Dr. Lappi very happy. Um, there are some questions also from the audience that uh, relate uh, to, to, to this topic we're talking about, and that is ultimately sensitivity. So sensitivity comes obviously with this, on the one hand with the scanner, uh, but on the other hand also with uh, the maximum amount you can label uh, before the cells don't do their job at all. So what is your experience uh, with this? Where are the sweet spots? What in the context of a white blood cell scan uh, is something that is tolerable to the cells and so that they still would work as, according to their diagnostic uh, intention? With the levels that we were labeling the cells, we, we didn't see any problem. We are by far, the limitation was the dose to the patient, not the cells. That's, that was a uh, 100%. And what does it then mean on the practical level? One could actually spin this around and say, well, in a very naive way, of course, but you could have lots of cells that you label uh, to small amounts, and uh, or you could uh, administer a lot less cells that you have labeled to a much higher amount uh, per cell. Um, what, which way would you prefer? Or what yeah. sort of homogeneity can you actually reach? And what is the variation in your experimentation that you see? So um, we didn't do a lot of variation with cells because remember we are actually taking blood from our friends and, and practicing. Uh, so we did some, some, some variation. You need a lot of cells to label. You cannot, I mean, just as most of the radiochemists out there will know, you cannot do 
very, very small scale labeling with a, with a very small amount of precursor because the kinetics fight you. Um, so as I, as I mentioned, you know, when we were doing healthy volunteers, we had to take over 100 milliliters of blood in order to get good cell labeling um, results. And so you really need to have a lot of cells in the first place in, so that you actually get reasonable incorporation. So it's actually not possible in, in our hands at least to, uh, to label a very small amount of cells with a lot of activity that never, that never worked for us. Okay, so just maybe this is a little bit for me to understand that also uh, is uh, in relation to a question from uh, some colleagues from the NIH. Um, so you say you need quite a lot of cells uh, to label properly. Um, so you see scale uh, issues, issues in scalability here, or maybe in other words, um, you would see that there are issues related to the microdosing concept, for example, is something that uh, people consider when they think about maybe CAR-T labeling that only a small proportion of those would get labeled uh, in order to get the biodistribution in the patient. Is, is, but, are there limitations along those lines? Uh, yeah, I think some of these can be addressed and, and some of it, you know, there's definitely a lot more work here that can be done and I encourage everybody to, to try. Um, <clears throat> I think that, so for our procedure, our goal was to keep things as similar to the Indium 111 labeled white blood cell labeling procedure as possible. And so we were trying to do the same thing that the industry partners do when they label things with Indium 111. And so because of that, we were kind of restricted on how we did things. And so because we were restricted on that, that's where we run into scalability. Now, if you're redoing the chemistry or changing things a little bit, or you can get things very concentrated or use, you know, have a lot of different um, different parameters that you can look at, I absolutely think that that things could change. And this is just kind of how it worked in our our scenario. Okay, and then uh, coming back to one of the things that you said very, very early on, where you also credited your commercial partner, I think. Oh, they were called Cardinal Health. They're Cardinal so Health, you... and I can say that because they're on they're on the original paper, so we have the disclosures. <laughs> uh, okay, yeah, but so that looked uh, uh, obviously to, to me here watching this and also to some others is well, you outsource this, of course, you outsource this because of uh, the the issues that you alluded to, which maybe for somebody like me coming from the other side of the pond, it's a situation maybe different, um, are not so clear in terms of uh, the blood labeling. So would you make any efforts to bring this in-house or do you think it is the better way to outsource this in general, maybe just because of the US uh, scenario? Or... So it depends on what you're doing. You know, if we do a lot of this, I think bringing it in-house makes sense. You need a dedicated facility. So we would have to basically build a room somewhere that was just used for that. To get us started and to make sure that it works, we actually have, we have a very good relationship with our industry partners. And so this was the fastest way forward for us because of course, building a clean room for labeling blood products uh, has a fairly significant financial implication. Um, and so when we, we looked at the regulatory environment, we looked at the options available and this at least to get us started made the most sense. If we start to do this in very, very high volume, uh, then we may go a different way. But I think that's that question is going to be different for every institution, depending on what resources you have available, what kind of people you have available, what your partnerships look like, um, and what the regulatory environment looks like. Okay, so thank you very much, uh, Dr. Lapi. This was great. Thank you very much for your patience, uh, for going through this conversation with me here and answering all of the questions uh, from the audience and also some of myself. Um, normally, we would give you a round of applause, you know, with the webinars, this is not that great, but uh, let's take this as a virtual applause. And I would like to just share my screen here now, and I hope uh, everyone can see, to remind you all of the fact uh, that this uh, seminar today was uh, done by the ICIT, so it's the Imaging and Cell and Immunotherapies Interest Group. So if you liked it, please make sure that uh, you participate in that group as much as possible, also at the upcoming uh, conference in Prague. And uh, so that brings me actually to 
this conference. So it, this is a little bit of self-advertisement for our society. So make sure for those who have not registered and have time to attend, it's going to be uh, great. It's the first time for a long uh, period of time that the conference is again in Europe. It's going to be 5th to 9th uh, of September in a fantastic city, in a very, very good venue, as I hear. And uh, what is also special this year is that it's not just a WMIC uh, annual conference, but there's also, and that's of interest to this uh, group, study group, there's also an immuno-oncology pre-meeting, and the program is already online for those of you who are interested. So with that, I would like uh, uh, to finish our today's webinar. I would like to thank again Dr. Lati for her fantastic talk and great insights and the time and patience for the, uh, answering all of the questions. And of course, everyone else uh, who attended for attending and sending these great questions uh, into our webinar discussion. So thank you very much and goodbye. Okay, we are no longer live. So thank you all so 